I'm Dave Kassler, KE0OG, with Ask Dave, Episode 8. Let's look at a topic that's the subject of a lot of folklore and even controversy, that of grounding your amateur radio station. Let me begin by noting that because of the safety implications of grounding, there are well-defined ways to ground utility power. The National Electric Code discusses these in detail. There is also a document worth knowing about that discusses grounding in communications facilities. It's called Motorola Standards and Guidelines for Communications Sites, Publications R56. You can search for it on the internet. Chapter 4 of the Motorola document discusses external grounding, and Chapter 5 discusses internal grounding. Appendix C discusses electrostatic discharge. The standard goes far beyond what most hams do and is worth taking a look at for good ideas. And please note this video is not a safety briefing, nor is it a substitute for one. The very earth beneath us conducts electricity. We can define the earth's voltage as zero. It serves as the reference voltage for most everything. Although the earth is not a perfect conductor, we can say that no matter where you tap it, its potential is zero volts. The process for doing this is called grounding or sometimes earthing. It simply means taking advantage of the fact that the ground voltage is zero no matter how much current you pass through it and it's zero everywhere. Well, of course, not exactly zero in all places, but quite close. There are three kinds of grounding. The first is electrical safety power grounding, such as for utility power. The second is the RF signal ground. And the third is lightning ground. Let's look first at electrical utility safety grounding. This simplified chart shows how our electrical system relies on grounding at multiple points. The power plants are grounded. The voltage is stepped up for transmission and travels sometimes great distances to the local distribution point. From here, two wires go forth, and one is called the neutral and is held at ground potential. When the local step-down transformer is encountered, again, the neutral side is held at ground potential. This goes into your house, and note here an interesting thing. There is a single point ground. The neutral connects to it. A wire exits your entrance point to a ground rod, and the safety ground, or green wire ground, is connected at this point too. You might ask, does this mean that the neutral at a given wall outlet is at ground potential? No, because current flows in the neutral line, and given the wire's resistance, the neutral point at the outlet can be above zero volts. This is important because if the neutral is connected to a chassis, there may be a voltage potential between it and ground sufficient to create an electrical shock. So, all equipment these days has a green wire ground that travels back to the single point ground. Since no current normally flows in this line, anything connected to it is likely at near zero potential. Let's look at how a simple wiring fault can lead to issues. If there is a fault, here meaning an open circuit, the entire load assumes 120 volts AC above ground. Touching any part of it that is connected to the line will result in a shock. So, we connect a third wire. This can be connected to parts of the load, such as a drill or a radio, that are touched by users. Then if there is a fault, the third wire keeps the exposed parts at ground potential, reducing the probability of shock. It should be noted that those appliances you have that don't have a ground plug are double insulated. In any event, never defeat the third wire ground because it's there for your safety. I've mentioned in previous videos that wind blowing across an exposed antenna wire can create an electrostatic charge. The wind takes away some of the electrons, and in the process, the wire becomes positively charged. Now, electricity wants to complete a circuit, so it looks for a way to ground. 
In your station, you need to provide this path. Otherwise, you can find rather large electrostatic voltages at the RF input. At VHF, antennas such as the J-pole are at ground potential at DC. And in fact, a wire should be attached that goes from there to the ground. I made the mistake once of ignoring this with a handheld radio connected to an external antenna, but nothing else. The electrostatic charge built up to the point that it damaged the handheld, and I had to send it back to the factory for repair. At HF, many antennas are at DC ground, meaning there's a way for these electrostatic voltages to discharge. But not all are. Dipoles, for example, are inherently balanced. The use of a ballon can help since these often provide a low impedance to ground for electrostatically induced DC currents. This brings us to the subject of the RF signal ground. There are many reasons for doing this. Proper grounding keeps the signal inside your coax and helps reduce the amount of signal on the outside of the coax. Good grounding also greatly reduces the amount of common mode noise in your antennas. It provides antenna tuners with a common DC reference voltage and helps them do a better job. Good grounding can keep RF out of your shack and help reduce the amount of RF interference that your household devices will suffer, such as televisions, stereos, and computers. Here's an example of how that would be done. Usually, the station ground is an 8-foot ground rod driven into the earth as close to the station as possible. You can get these ground rods from Home Depot or similar stores. A short, highly conductive wire connects the ground rod to your station single point ground. Now, I need to mention a couple things. RF power tends to flow along the surface of the wire. And the signal ground if it is a significant fraction of a wavelength, which is almost always the case, is best represented as a transmission line. As such, it can radiate RF. One way to help this is to make the ground run as short as possible. Another way is to use a flat conductor, such as copper strap, because the flat strap has lots of surface area and is therefore a better conductor of RF. Let me give you an example that happened to me. Over the summer, I refurbished this ground-mounted Butternut HF9V antenna. It's well grounded with some buried bare radials. I feed it with coax. I connected this to my radio and heard all kinds of noise, much of it man-made. So, I connected the cable shield to my station ground prior to bringing it into the shack. The noise disappeared. Even though the transmission line was grounded on the antenna side, it acted as an antenna itself and picked up serious noise. So now, it's grounded on both ends. Now, you may ask, isn't the station grounded via the power supply, which after all has a three-wire ground plug? Yes, that helps when dealing with DC electrostatic currents, but usually the utility electrical ground point is so far away that the household wiring can act as an antenna. It's much better to have a dedicated station RF ground. You may also have heard of ground loops, where daisy chaining grounds together can create current loops, which in turn act as loop antennas. So we come back to the concept of a single point ground. In this diagram, we see a single point ground, for example, a length of one inch copper pipe, such as is used in household plumbing. The pipe is the station's single point ground. A stout wire or strap connects this to the ground rod. And then everything in the shack connects to the single point ground. Setting up a ground system is no guarantee that RFI problems will completely disappear. You may have to change dimensions, route cables differently, and experiment. I have the RFI almost completely out of my shack, but I have some computer speakers that object mightily to my 80 meter signals. I simply turn them off. Let's turn to lightning. I have had lightning strike my station. Oh, what a noise that makes! 
One direct strike vaporized my 20 meter dipole. Fortunately, I had my rig completely disconnected from everything, so it was fine, but my power supply and antenna tuner were not so lucky. A good practice is that you disconnect everything when there's a storm nearby. If you are in a particularly lightning prone area, leave everything disconnected all the time except when you're operating. This brings us to the lightning arrestor. Several companies such as Alpha Delta make lightning arresters for all sorts of applications. I have four, one each for my two HF and two VHF antennas. They mount right on the ground rod. Note this provides the additional advantage of grounding the cable shield prior to coming into my shack. This is how a lightning protector works. Inside the arrestor is a spark gap. Under normal operating conditions, there's no spark. But in the event of a lightning strike or a nearby strike that induces large voltages in your antenna, the spark will fire. The current flows from antenna to ground, bypassing your rig. The spark itself is a flow of current through a conductor, in this case air. When the spark is actually flowing, the voltage drop across the spark is not that high, on the order of several volts, and effectively acts as a short circuit. So this keeps the radio from seeing more than a few volts. Now, let me point out that in the case of a direct strike, unpredictable things can happen. Lightning usually follows the most convenient way to ground. It has a mind of its own and doesn't ask permission from anyone. Let me cover a few special topics. For grounds, we use mechanical connections, such as this connector that attaches a wire to the ground rod. Wires can carry significant currents for short durations, such as that of a lightning strike, though they'll likely heat up quite a bit. If a joint is secured with solder, this heat can vaporize the solder and send it flying everywhere, not a safe situation at all. Therefore, we use connectors that make a compression connection. It is best if you connect or bond your various ground systems in your home. For example, I have connected the household electrical ground to my station ground with this thick copper wire. Note the use of compression connectors. I thought doing so might increase station RF noise, but it didn't. You also need to think about dissimilar metals. Two unlike metals, when forced together, can lead to corrosion. Copper to copper is okay. Copper to aluminum is not. If you must make such a connection, do it with stainless steel connectors available from your local hardware store in such a way that the copper and aluminum don't touch directly. There is also something called cathodic erosion. Subtle currents flowing in the ground can cause the metal to be eaten away. I've never heard of a ham having this problem, but it can happen. You'll need to seek professional help with this one in the unlikely event it happens to you. Classically, people have connected their grounds to cold water pipes. These days, pipes are copper inside the house, but often the supply line is plastic, so connecting to it does no good. And never connect your ground to a gas line. As you can see with mine, the gas line itself is plastic outside the home, and using the metal portion can lead to a fire. Lastly, I warn you against folklore. The proper way to ground a station has been a topic of conversation for as long as there has been radio. Frankly, much of what you hear is bunk. Stick to published sources, such as the ARRL handbook or the two standards I mentioned earlier. Keep it simple and find something that works for you. This episode's photograph is taken during the fall color season from Uray County Road 5, about 10 miles from our home. Our trees turn color at the end of September and early October. Fall is one of my favorite times of the year. Please subscribe so you can get notification of future videos. If you wish, you can also put something in the tip jar, either using the YouTube method or the PayPal link on my website at ke0og.net.
Send questions to me via a comment to this video or directly at ke0og.net slash ask hyphen Dave. Until next time, 73.